So before we begin here today, I'd like to have prayer and I'd like to ask God to take all of the noise in our minds outside. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you and you alone have the honor and the glory and deserve the worship and the praise. Father, there are things that chase us every day and I pray that you will put a wall around us, that you will remove the distractions, that you will get rid of the noise that keeps us from hearing your voice. And today, Father, as we open your word, I pray that your word will be clear. I pray that your message will be sure. And I pray that our hearts will be touched. Give us ears to hear, Father, and let the words be yours. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's so easy to look around the world today, isn't it, and get concerned. It's so easy today that we can turn on the television and watch the news, and as we see the news play out in front of our eyes and we hear the warnings and we hear the different messages, it's very easy to see that in the world today there's a great deal of lawlessness, isn't there? And yet, when we read the Bible, if you will turn with me to Matthew 24, Matthew 24 is where we're going to start. We're going to look at a time when Jesus made a prediction as the disciples came around him and they showed him the majesty of the temple. The disciples expected Jesus to come set up his kingdom on this earth. And Jesus said to them that there will not be one stone left upon another. And this boggled their minds. They couldn't believe that that was ever going to happen because the temple really was a beautiful monument to God's majesty. The problem was God ceased to dwell in that temple. They came, they called, they asked, they pleaded, and God still left the temple. They wanted God to come into the temple under their own conditions. And so Jesus said, not one stone will be left. And so when Jesus said that, all of the people looked at Jesus and they're going, that must be, with not one stone left, the day that you're going to come. And so they asked him, what will be the events that take place when not one stone is left? But then they didn't stop there. And they said, and what will be the signs of your coming? Because they assumed it was all at one time. In today's world, as people, and I've been saying it for years, Jesus is coming soon. Do we believe that? And as we look around the world today, we have the temptation to believe it even more because Jesus said that there would be signs showing his soon return. He said that there would be earthquakes. Are we having earthquakes? He said that we would have pestilence. Are we having pestilence? He said that there would be wars and rumors of wars. Are we not seeing wars and rumors of wars? And we see those things and they're getting more and more obvious. And so we have a tendency to believe that this scripture, the scripture today is Matthew 24, and I'm going to read from verses 9 through 13. And it says this, and this is Jesus. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Seems to be coming to pass, doesn't it? And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. I want to look at verse 12, and it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, depending on the, the uh, version that you have, it might say iniquity, it might say sin, it also might say lawlessness. As we look around the world today, do we not see lawlessness? 
The problem is we're looking in the wrong place. As we look around the world today and we see lawlessness, we see all of these protests, all of these things out of control, all of these people being hurt, all of these buildings being destroyed, we see lawlessness in the street. But I want to talk to you today about the lawlessness that Jesus is talking about. Because we have this tendency to try to put worldly definitions on divine words. And so when we look at what lawlessness is, when we look at the land, when we look at the fact that we have laws in the land, you understand that the laws in the land are given to us for one purpose. They're not given to change your heart. They're given to warn you that there's going to be a consequence if you break that law, you're going to go to prison, you're going to go be arrested, you're going to have to go to court, you're going to be fined. And so we look at that and we look at the land and we say there's lawlessness in the land. That's not the lawlessness that Jesus was talking about. But we have this tendency to try to look at that lawlessness and say that that's what Jesus was warning us about. There's a speed limit. How many of you break it? I mean, I don't break it. I know the police won't stop me if I'm five miles an hour over, so that's what I do. I go five miles an hour over. Isn't that legal? No. So when we look at the land and the laws of the land, we determine what the laws of the land should mean. But God's law is different. Man's law is a boundary to keep those people who break it away from those people who don't. Or to keep the people who don't want to break the law safe from the people who do. God never gave his law as a boundary so that you could live by that law and be saved. I'm going to say that again. God never gave his law as a boundary so that you could live by that law and be saved. Well, but we're told in Galatians, and we've gone over this before, Galatians 2, Galatians 3, that no one can be saved by the works of the law. Is that not true? We've also been told that the law is a schoolmaster to lead us to our need of Christ. Keeping the law of God does not save you, never will, it never could. The law was given by God as a mirror to show us our need. It's the standard of the character of God. When we understand that completely, when we understand that the law is the character of God, it's a standard that is in place because that's the requirement to live in heaven. Does that make sense? If you don't live in accordance with the law of God, which means in accordance with the character of God, if you don't look like Jesus, and we'll know him when he comes because we will what? We will look like him. So I want you to understand today what Jesus was talking about, lawlessness will abound and love will wax cold. If we stop for a minute and we look around in the world, it's not hard to see. It's not the lawlessness of people against people. It's a lawlessness, the rebellion against the character of God. We want to live the way we want to live, and as a result, rather than looking at the standard that God has raised up, we rebel against it. We try to explain it away. Many false prophets, we're told, will come, and many false prophets have. Everything that we hear should be based on this book. Yet lawlessness is the desire to push God's law aside. And so I want to take a look at Scripture, and I want you to see something. Because in today's world, there's a movement called social justice. And that movement wants to set up its own rules, its own boundaries, and if you don't live within those boundaries, then there will be punishment, ridicule, hate. And I want us to understand truly what we're up against today and actually focus on what it's going to take to change us. Now, we're told that many will persecute us. Isn't that what we just read? And that some of us will be given up to be killed. Now, all we've got to do is look back in history, and this sermon, please, is not about trying to scare you. This sermon is about trying to understand the faithfulness of God, his patience, his long-suffering, and most of all, his mercy. 
And so God has given us this standard, and we're told that those people who keep that standard will be persecuted. They will hate those people because of Christ. So as we come today to meet, there's a temptation to wants to rebel against unfair laws, unfair practices, unfair things going on. But when we look at the example of Christ, we don't see that lived out in his life. What we see is that Christ came to save and seek those who are lost. Is that not true? And so what is our example? Our example now is to go and seek and save those who are lost. And beloved, you can't be saved by the law of the land. And you can't be saved by the law of God unless you use it the way God intended it to be used. And so this revelation that Christ is giving his followers is that there's going to be a movement in the end of time that began clear back in heaven to do away with the standard of God. And so I want to go through the scriptures with you today, and I want to look at what the standard of God is all about, what it's for, and what God tells us that we should look for. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 John chapter 3. Now we're leaving where Christ has said, and I'll read it again, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations. Why? For my name's sake. We're not hated because we have different political understandings. If you're hated for that, that's got nothing to do with what God's warning you about. We're to be hated because of God's name and because we live like God. And it goes on and it says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And in verse 12, And because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Lawlessness, what does that mean? As we look to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, and I'm going to start in verse number 2. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 2. It says this, this is John, John the Beloved, John the one who talks about the love of God constantly. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him, that's in Christ, purifies himself even as he is. God is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. In other versions it will say, for sin is lawlessness. So when we understand that what Christ is trying to warn us about is the absence of the standard or character of God in our lives, as we look around, we sometimes battle with the fact that we've done something wrong. Has anybody ever done something wrong, or is it just me? And so as I look at that and I go, okay, what can I do now to change that? And so there's this battle inside of me that all of a sudden I see that something's wrong, and I try to control the urge to do it again. The problem is, that's not what God's law was given to us for. God's law was given to us so that we can go to Christ, confess our sins, repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and faithfully depend on the power of Christ to work in us to do his good pleasure. He wants to work out his will in each one of us. The problem is we try to work out his will in each one of us. I want to read something here because I... I believe that we have been given a prophet, and I believe the instruction that she gives is timeless. And I want to read something here. It's, it's found in the testimonies. Uh, it's also found in other compilations, and I can give you those later. But it says, perfect love produces sanctification. And we're here to be sanctified, aren't we? We're here to be changed into his likeness. Because we're told that lawlessness without the character of Christ, there's going to be a problem. And it says this, perfect love produces sanctification. In the life of John, true sanctification is exemplified. 
During the years of his close association with Christ, he was often warned by the Savior, and these reproaches he accepted. He saw his deficiencies and was humbled by the revelation. Day by day, his heart was drawn out to Christ until he lost sight of self in love for his master. The strength and patience that he saw in the Son of God filled his soul with admiration. He yielded his resentful, ambitious temper to Christ, and divine love brought transformation of character. So we're told over and over to come into the presence of God, to allow his picture to change who we are. But to do that, we have to see that picture, and we have to realize, number one, our need, and number two, his great mercy, his great love, his continued sacrifice as he works in us to work out his will, to do his good pleasure. And so we need to understand that John had evil tendencies, just like all the rest of us. And yet in his connection with Christ, when Christ showed him what he was doing wrong, he humbled himself and wanted to please the master and allow the master to do a work in him that he couldn't do himself. Well, but we try so hard. And we continue to look at our sins rather than the goodness and the love and the grace of God. It isn't just overcoming once. Because all of us can overcome once. It's a matter of surrendering what's inside of us that's broken. We look around the world and there is horrible interaction between people. There is cruelty. There is prejudice. People kill. People murder. There's bias. And yet we think in the world, if we can make hashtag whatever it's going to be or make a new law, that all of a sudden it's going to change the world. But it doesn't change the world. It might put some people in jail. It might not. But God isn't waiting for the world to be a nice place to live. As a matter of fact, God says in the end, the world's not going to be a nice place to live. And those people who love Jesus and are waiting for Jesus to come back, those people are going to be attacked by the very world that's trying to make all these laws. And so I want you to understand that there's going to be a trial that we go through, but God promises not that he'll leave us alone, but that he'll walk through that trial with us. And so he wants us to understand his goodness. He wants us to understand what he offers us is a strength that we can get no other way. And if we look back at the Reformation and we see the martyrs that were put up then, we see the fact that they trusted God. And as they trusted God, they went to the stake singing well, but I'm not looking forward to being a martyr, and I'm not looking forward to dying, but I am looking forward to knowing Christ so completely that I'll have a peace that no matter what happens in the world, I will know in whom I believe. And that happens by a day-at-a-time communion with Christ. A day-at-a-time relationship, and John had that relationship with Christ. But it goes on, and it says this, in striking contrast is the experience of Judas, who professed to be a disciple of Christ, but possessed only a form of godliness. Often, as he listened to the Savior's words, conviction came, but he would not humble his heart or confess his sins. By resisting the divine influence, he dishonored the master. John warred earnestly against his faults. But Judas violated his conscience, fastening on himself more securely his habits of evil. The truth of Christ taught was at variance with his desires, and he could not yield his ideas. Covetousness, revengeful passions, dark and sullen thoughts were cherished until Satan gained full control of him. John and Judas had the same opportunities. Both were closely associated with Jesus. Each possessed serious defects of character. Each possessed serious defects of character. Each had access to divine grace. But while one was learning of Jesus, the other was a hearer only. One daily overcoming sin was sanctified through the truth. 
the other resisting the transforming power of grace and indulgence, self-desire, selfish desires, was brought into bondage to Satan. Beloved, there's a, there's a battle that's going on, and God wants us to understand that he is the one who brings the solution to what we need. Turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to be in verse 16. Chapter 6, verse 16, and it starts like this. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are, to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. We need to understand that when Jesus Christ came, he came to deliver us from our sins. And I want you to get that. I want you to finally maybe be able to internalize that. Jesus came to deliver us from our sins. Jesus didn't come just to give us an example of what we're supposed to live like and then go back to heaven and say, work it out on your own. Jesus came, died on the cross, that he might deliver us from our sins, that he might work in us and make a difference. When we talk about the lawlessness of the world and we look around and we say, look at all the wars and the rumors of wars, beloved, that's a sign of the people who have not allowed the character of Christ to come into their heart. It's so easy in the church, it's so easy in the church to find fault, isn't it? I mean, all you got to do is look in the mirror and you can find all the faults you need. But it's easier if I can look at somebody else. Oh, and friends, it's so easy to talk about other people. But Jesus said that he came to save me from my sin. He came to make me like him. He came to do that work. And the problem is, as he convicts me, I'm so twisted in my own heart that I want to make an excuse and blame somebody else or say that's not what he meant. Have you heard that? God didn't really mean what he was saying there. I've been in so many Bible studies, and I say, this is what the word says. Oh, he didn't mean that. Oh, how can you argue against that? We come to the place where we don't want to hear what God has to say, and as a result, we live in a way that actually pushes God away. But God has so much patience with us that he continues to work in us. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. In other words, Versions that says being free from lawlessness. And then he goes on, he says this, I speak, this is Paul, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, the weakness of your flesh. I'm speaking after the manner of men. For as you have yielded your members' servants to lawlessness and to iniquity unto iniquity, or to lawlessness unto more lawlessness, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. The problem isn't that God is not able. The problem is that we don't see a true picture of God. We look so closely at all of the other people in our lives or in the world or our relationships and we don't see the goodness, the long-suffering, the mercy, the patience of God. We need to take the time to look at what it was that Christ did for us. Actually, take a look at what Christ did for each one of us. Look at the mercy of God. Look at the sustaining love of God as he continues to work in our hearts. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't walk off. 
But today, with all the noise in the world, we get caught up in all of these other things. And beloved, it is so much easier to join some cause than to die to self. It's so much easier to get in some protest rather than allowing God to humble the selfish nature that we have and allow him to replace it with his goodness and love so that we can demonstrate to the world that God has a power and a strength to take our lawlessness condition and fill us with his character, fill us with his heart, fill us with his love. God wants us to know that he loves us so much that he left heaven. Have we really thought about what that is? And I ask you that in this manner. Do we not have the great commission to go ye therefore into all the world? Do we not have that? I mean, I know we do. You know we do. And yet, how much time do we spend doing that? Christ left heaven. Do you leave your homes? Christ left the adoring angels. Do you bother going out to meet the people who want to tear you apart? Christ became a human. He changed. He gave up on the presence. Are you willing to give up? And please don't. I'm going to name him anyway. But, but, but don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Are you willing to give up the TV? Are you willing to give up your coffee? Are you willing to give up your time alone? Are you willing to give up the things that you want to do to serve yourself so that you can go out and reach someone else for Jesus Christ? Do you understand that Christ gave up everything and then endured the shame even of the cross for what? For the joy that was set before him. See, if, if, if we can come face to face with Christ, if we can see how he lived, if we can see the sacrifices he made for our good and our rebellion and our absolute futility in trying to live the life of Christ without allowing Christ to live in us, if we, if we could see that, it should bring tears to our eyes to try to understand what it is that Christ has done for us. And yet, we just keep pushing him away. And so I want us to understand today that God had a purpose in coming. And it wasn't just so he could look good. It wasn't just so that he could have a name higher than any other name in heaven. He came because Kim doesn't have the strength to do what Kim needs to do to change so that he can come back into God's presence. And I want you to understand that he knew I didn't have the strength, so he came down here to save me. Now, if I step on your toes, you may not care if he saves me. But if I'm a nice guy and I say all the right words to you, because you and your selfish nature want me to be that way, you might pray for me. But Jesus didn't just pray for me. Jesus didn't just come down for me. Jesus died for me and for you. Do we see the picture of God that we need to see to want to be the people of God? And this is what I want us to understand. It is lawlessness that's causing the problem, but it's not the lawlessness of the people out there. It's the lawlessness in our hearts because we won't accept the mercy of God. Beloved, it's not about changing the world. It's about allowing God to change our hearts so that he might be glorified. We've lost the focus on what this is all about. In our desire to have what we want, we don't want to give God what we need to. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And we're almost done. 
We're almost done. Titus chapter 2. I've read, I've, I've quoted this, I've read this, I'm just going to go through it again, but I want you to hear the end of it. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Is the world around us godly? It's not. Not even close. But we're supposed to live that way. We're not to join the world in their behavior. We live soberly, godly, righteous lives, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're not looking for a better world. We're looking for Jesus to come back. We're looking for Jesus to come and receive us that we might be where he is. I want us... 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem from all lawlessness and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. It's to be an action out of the heart that takes place in spite of ourselves. In spite of our selfish inclinations, when we come into God's presence and he works in us to do that which he wants done, it will happen because he has worked it out. And it will be spontaneous. It's hard now because I don't want to do it. But by being obedient, by doing the things that he's asked us to do, he will create in us. This is a promise of God that he will do this. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to start in verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 14, it says this. Because we've all heard this scripture, and I've used it every time I've done a wedding. Every time I've used this scripture. But I want us to understand what Christ meant by it when he inspired Paul and others to bring us this term. I want you to see what it is that Jesus wants. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness. And what concord has Christ with Belial? How can they exist together? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? Now we can take that and we can twist it and we can make it sound very harsh. But that's not what Paul was trying to do. He was trying to make the point that if we embrace lawlessness or if we embrace the cause of lawlessness, and that means doing away with God's law, if we embrace that thinking that we can change someone somehow, have you ever heard that? Well, I know, but I'm going to win him to Christ. When we talk about being unyoked, I mean, we all, anybody who has children have heard that. Matter of fact, you may have said it yourself. I tried that. It didn't work. But I'm just telling you, so it's not that. God's not trying to say, no, you can't marry. That's not God's point. God's point is Jesus loves us. And because he loves us, he doesn't want us to put ourselves in a position outside of his will that he can't defend or work in us. Now, he's patient, he's long-suffering, he's graceful. And at the point we repent of our sin, turn from our sin, and come back to him, he will do everything within his power to save us. So don't get me wrong. But here's the reason. It says this. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now listen. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. 
saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God wants us to know that he doesn't want us to fall into a situation that brings us into contact with lawlessness. Now, I'm going to speak very plainly here so that you understand what I'm trying to say, but I'm not trying to bash. I love this when people talk about bashing. I want you to understand that bashing is not saying something unkind. That's a description that was given by people who want to control what you say. Bashing is taking a solid club and crushing tissue to a hard rock. That's bashing. Bashing is not saying the truth about something and revealing lawlessness. That's not bashing. If that's bashing, then Christ was a basher. And we know that God is love. So we need to understand, I'm talking about lawlessness. As we watch our country make laws that go against the laws of God, that's lawlessness. And when we take the opportunity to join in with those who practice lawlessness, we allow Satan, to gain access of our emotions and our character, and as we practice lawlessness, we become lawless. We just read that. And so we need to understand that we're to separate ourselves from those that are lawless. So if we're making laws in this nation that have nothing to do with God's purpose for our lives, we're placing ourselves on dangerous ground. It is not our responsibility to join revolutions. It is our responsibility to surrender self to God so he can do something in us that will make us live a life like Christ, which will be loving, which will be patient, which will be kind, which will be other-centered, which will be to defend those who are being mistreated, those are all things that need to be in our character if we're going to be like Christ. And more importantly, it should be an outflowing, a natural outflowing of our heart and who we are not to live a life that's abusive or coercive or judgmental. And the list goes on. Beloved, as a church today, we're faced with a time in history that needs to see the character of God lived out in his people, that we might live a life that is other-centered, caring, loving, kind, and bringing people to Christ. Because Christ is the only way to be saved. When our focus changes and becomes political, then we call Christ a liar. And we can't do that. So we need to understand that Jesus has a purpose for us. Come out from among them. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Don't become entangled with something that is not leading you closer to God. We're not here to save the world. We're here to be like Jesus Christ and live apart from the taint of the world not act like the world. Turn with me if you will. We have two more scriptures. Matthew 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 39. That's where we're going to start. Because I want you to see that Jesus addressed this very issue. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 39, and it says this. The enemy, this is Jesus had talked to his disciples. He's told the parable about the seed, the parable of the tares in the field. In verse 39, he's saying, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Now, can that be more clear? The devil sowed the seeds of dissent. The harvest is when? The end of the world. And who are the harvesters? Oh, I thought it was me. I thought I got to go out and judge people. Right? The end of the world is the harvest, and the harvesters are the angels, and Jesus sends the angels to get the harvest. Our job is to be ready for the harvest by allowing Christ to work in us, to work out his will 
in us. That's our focus. And to represent him clearly to other people. We aren't supposed to live in a closet. But we also aren't to entangle ourselves with ungodly, unlawful things. And so it says this, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. So lawlessness is going to be gathered, iniquity, sin. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do lawlessness, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who has ears, let him hear. So we're being told by Christ himself in his own parable that at the end of the world there will be two groups. There will be those without his law, not people in prison, not people that steal cars. I'm not talking about man's law. There will be people over here on this side that do not have God's law in their hearts. And they're going to be gathered, and Christ said, He's going to do away with lawlessness. It will be done. Sin will finally be destroyed. And those who have allowed God to work in their hearts and bring out the character of God in them, those people will be in God's kingdom. That he's going to come. There's going to be a group. I want to read this, and then I want to close with one scripture. There exists in these last days evils similar to those that threatened the early church. You must have love, is the cry heard everywhere, especially from those who profess sanctification. But true love is too pure to cover unconfessed sin. While we are to love souls, we are to make no compromise with evil. We are not to unite with the rebellious and call this love. God requires his people to stand for the right as unflinchingly as did John in opposition to soul-destroying errors. The apostle teaches that we are to deal in plain terms with sin and sinners. This is not inconsistent with true love. Everyone who commits sin, he writes, is guilty of lawlessness Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. That sounds strong. But remember, it's not my work to change myself. It's his work. And we are saved by grace through faith, not that of ourselves, but it's a gift from God that no man may boast. So when God says, I'm going to change you, and you say he can't do it, you're calling him a liar. But if we turn to him constantly like John did, eventually he will finish the work. Is he going to do it in a moment? No. It's going to be the work of a lifetime. It's going to be a constant surrender because until he comes, there's going to be a tempter on this earth. There's going to be a battle to fight. There's going to be a war, and we're going to have to choose over and over and over again who we will follow. And the world is going to put pressure on us to join their cause, their fight, their world, their protest. And God says, don't join He doesn't say hurt people. He doesn't say offend people. He doesn't say do things to people that are wrong. But our purpose on this earth is to become like Jesus Christ in character. And we're told over and over that that has to happen. I want to close with this scripture because we are all sitting in church and all of us might have to face this particular situation. 
In closing, turn with me, if you would, to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And I want to bring this to a conclusion. Matthew chapter 7. This is Jesus. This is Jesus, the one who died for you. This is Jesus, the one who died for me. This is Jesus, the one who came down from heaven. This is Jesus who is love because God is love. This is Jesus speaking. And it's a very solemn warning. But I want us to understand that not just coming to church, not just belonging to a particular church, not, not even going out and saying the right things is going to help. It says this, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that are lawless. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. Jesus in his final hours said, I have glorified you as he was talking to his father in John 17. I have glorified you on this earth. Now glorify me with the glory that I had before the foundations of the world. God wants each one of us to be filled with the glory of God. And in Revelation chapter 18, it says that the glory of God will light the whole world. We will be a light shining out in darkness. Not because we made one decision, but because we've made the decision over and over and over as God works in us to work out his good pleasure. And Jesus in John 17, 17 said to the Father, he said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus wants us to understand that the Father has a job to do. Scripture says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Sounds like the wrong thing to say, isn't it? But the very next verse says, for it is God that works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God never fails. God always succeeds. And in closing, and everyone that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. Friends, we get to decide where we're going to build our house. I want to build mine on the rock. Heavenly Father, the day approaches when you will come in the clouds. But before that comes, there is a work in us that you want to do. Father, help each one of us to build our house on the rock. Help each one of us stand for you when standing for you won't be popular. Help each one of us begin to prepare today for the time that is coming because the day is coming, Father, when the world is going to have one agenda, but you have given us another. Father, fill us, change us, work in us, prepare us that you might fill us with your spirit, that we might serve you, with power from on high. 
Father, we can be rebellious and stubborn, but your love and your patience is beyond anything we can do. Help us, Father, that our hearts may turn to you, that we see you for who you are, and we recognize our need of that power to change. Bless us, walk with us, put your angels about us. Father, may you be glorified by everything that is said and done. Keep us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen.